Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, thanks for joining us, uh, those of you who are new to the track, and welcome back, people who have been in the track all day. <laughs> um, I want to take a brief moment to introduce our three uh, excellent speakers for this next session around institutionalizing global KM and organizational learning. Um, first, we have Adrian Rivera Reyes to my far left, I guess your right, is it? <laughs> Gonna get that backwards. He is the Knowledge Management and Organizational Learning Advisor at the Bureau for Policy Planning and Learning with the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. That's a big, long mouthful, so I'm just gonna say USAID for the next one. Uh, Melissa, who is directly to my left, is a senior at Comal. Is that, so that's just the abbreviation, right? Do you say Comal, or do you say KMO? KMO. KMOL. See, I'm totally goofing this up, but KMOL uh, <laughs> with USAID, and she oversees the efforts to develop their uh, KMOL policy and processes. And then in the middle is Tom Sinclair, who is the Interim VP International Practice KM and Organizational Learning with BICSOL. Am I saying that one right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to a pronunciation course after to make sure I know all these things. Anyhow, I'm going to pass it over to them to share their information today. Thanks. Thank Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. It's um, lovely that you've chosen to join us um, to hear about how we've undertaken developing our own policy for knowledge management and organizational learning at USAID. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of our agenda. We're just going to talk about this function situated within our agency um, and then talk through the policy, the components of the policy, what we are requiring uh, it within our policy. Um, for our organization, how we plan to support implementation, and then we'll have time, hopefully, at the end for some questions and answers. Um, so just quickly, uh, US, the U.S. Agency for International Development, if you're not aware, we are a federal government agency. We're the primary foreign assistance providing U.S. government agency. We have a very globally dispersed workforce. We work in over 100 countries. We have overseas offices that we call missions in 80 countries. We work in a wide range of sectors from health to education to agriculture to democracy and governance to crisis and stabilization to disaster response after natural disasters. So our work spans the gamut of the kinds of things that can be done. And uh, suffice it to say, we are a large organization, but not too large by federal government standards, 11,000 in our global workforce in different categories. Um, and it's fair to say we operate a little bit like a federation. We are one agency, but we definitely have variations in practices um, across these sectors and across the region. So that presents some unique challenges for how we would approach knowledge management and trying to break down silos uh, to really foster organizational learning. And that created some unique considerations for us in our policy development process. Um, so we, in 2018, we did a study um, that was part of an agency reform effort um, that looked at knowledge management at our organization. We had lots of examples great silos of excellence as we consider them good examples of practices in different places. However, we had some key gaps. We, ha we were reinventing the wheel in many cases, and we had some areas where some standards and common approaches would be useful to elevate to, to become an agency standard. And so that study produced a few recommendations. One of them was hire something akin to a chief knowledge officer, a senior agency level official that's not necessarily housed within IT or within HR or within training. Um, but can transcend those different functions in our organization. Uh, convene knowledge sharing fora uh, for our staff and provide guidance. Fill in those gaps that I mentioned on systems, on practices, on skills uh, to bring to bear and to establish a policy. So we created that function, then we hired our first agency knowledge management and organizational learning officer Stacy Young, that position was created in 2019, so yay, we got part of the way there. Um, and then we housed the function in our central policy bureau. 
And then we set about putting in place what we needed to do to get to an agency policy. We gathered evidence, we looked, researched other peer organizations, other bilateral donors, multi multilateral development banks. Um, we looked at audit, KM audits and assessments that had been done within our organization. We looked at need statements, a, a whole lot of adjacent um, materials uh, were consumed in our document review. And then we did consultations with our staff, we did interviews with other donors. And we had a process to bring together uh, different experts. We have KMOL experts in many places in our agency, and we brought those people together to help form the basis of, of what, would, would, um, what we would eventually have in our policy. We had a number of different drafts, versions of drafts that we did. We had an intensive agency-wide comment period, um, and then we had then we rewrote, and then we had an intensive external review uh, with different stakeholders. And then we rewrote, um, and so and then we rewrote again, and then we uh, subjected the the policy to an agency clearance process, and we are near the end of that now. Um, we have a final step to go. We're hoping for our leadership approval by the end of this calendar year, so it will be fanfare and lots of celebration um, that we will have finally have gotten to an agency level policy that um, that we're able to hold up. So just a couple quick words on definitions. I think everybody in this room knows there are a lot of definitions. We did not want to get mired in definition purgatory. So we chose some working definitions that we would use for the purposes of our policy that are derived from the fields of knowledge management, from organizational learning. And these are those. These are those definitions that we used. Um, we, and we, I will say quickly that we focused on bringing together knowledge management as well as organizational learning because they're, those were critical to meeting our needs in our organization in order to break across silos, in order to think about how we use what one entity learns, how we share that among peers, how we elevate that and repeat over time and continually get better. We thought that the organizational learning was really important to also feature in our policy as well as knowledge management. So with that, I am going to hand it over to my colleague Tom, who's going to run us through the content of the policy. Thank you, Melissa. So the draft policy sets out a vision to strengthen KMOL investments, so knowledge management and organizational learning investments. Um, investments, infrastructure, and norms to fully leverage knowledge to advance the agency's mission. The policy's core aims lie in humanitarian and development outcomes spanning both programs and operations. Everything the agency does involves people applying what they know to what they do. The vision of the policy is to improve the agency's ability to harness its cumulative knowledge learn from it, and apply those lessons to its work to achieve better development results. There are three interrelated goals for the policy. The first is to steward knowledge as a collective agency asset. It's, this is the knowledge of USAID staff and partners. And this knowledge must be effectively generated, stored, organized, and shared for use in our programs. The second goal is to leverage knowledge and learning as an essential resource for development and humanitarian work. Knowledge and learning are program assets, program resources that should be used strategically alongside funding and personnel. The third goal is to invest in local knowledge systems. So effective KM is essential for country governments, country governments and local and regional organizations and other development actors. So USAID will complement the work it's doing on its own KMOL with investments that will strengthen local learning ecosystems in the countries where it works. So this is the full picture, but we're going to go through this. Um, we're going to deconstruct it because this, as you see, contains the goals and the vision that we mentioned, but it also contains seven principles, six leverage points, uh, or action points that will attempt to make change in three different business processes. So I have about eight minutes to deconstruct all of that. You, you have more. I have more, okay, all right. I'm still gonna go fast though, because 
We got, we, I, got, I got time because I got a lot to say. <laughs> you ready? Is everybody ready? All right. So let's look at the principles first. So there are seven principles. Um, knowledge, KMOL specifically, should be human-centered, integrated, resourced, accessible, focused, local, and dynamic. So let's take each one of those one at a time. So human-centered. Humans generate and use knowledge. They organize, share, and apply knowledge to create value or support the decisions that they're making. The human-centered nature of, of knowledge provides the basis for KM processes, tools, and systems. So diverse individuals can contribute to, understand, and use the knowledge base to achieve their own objectives. KMOL needs to be integrated, so it can't be siloed somewhere else in the agency. It must be integrated into the agency's core business processes, including the way we design awards, the way we manage grants and contracts, the way we hire and retain staff, the way we transition staff, and formulating and, exec and executing budgets and results reporting. It must be focused. Staff and partners need a curated, synthesized and packaged knowledge that is actionable and tailored to the context for which they work. And curation requires streamlining data and archiving knowledge products that are no longer useful. It needs to be accessible. So all users need to be able to easily access and digest knowledge. Grounding the agency's KMOL work in human-centered design and ensuring that it gets resourced will uh, ensure that it's accessible. And accessibility increases equity, reduces power imbalances, and enhances transparency and knowledge sharing. As I said, it needs to be resourced. So the agency must intentionally invest funds and human resources to ensure that staff, programs, and functions can build on existing knowledge, steward that knowledge, and continuously learn and improve. And it needs to value local knowledge, the local knowledge where, in the places where USAID works. To ensure greater sustainability, the agency will value and equitably engage local and indigenous knowledge and perspectives. This may include mindsets, worldviews, experiences, evidence, and know-how that allows locally-led and sustainable development to revolve around local ownership, local priorities, and perceptions of progress. And finally, it needs to be dynamic. For knowledge to remain a key asset driving development impact, it can't be treated as static. Leadership and infrastructure must support staff's ability to continually engage in learning and build on individual and collective knowledge. All right, so that is what's underlying the policy. And to make it actionable, we've developed these six leverage or action points. So let's take these one at a time. So our first leverage point revolves around people. So each person has a role in maintaining and using organizational learning processes. The success of the policy will depend on staff understanding their responsibilities, building their skills, and integrating KMOL in their day-to-day -day work. Second leverage point focuses on practices. USAID has many strong KM practices. We have a long history in this work, including performance management plans, communities of practice, an agency learning agenda, and other sectoral learning agendas. And additionally, our implementing partners play important roles in documenting and sharing agency knowledge uh, and, and identifying learning opportunities. But the agency will attempt to standardize and reduce burdens and gain efficiencies while also ensuring that we leave room for customization so practices are fit for purpose. Our third leverage point focuses around culture. So the agency already has an existing collaborating, learning, and adapting, or CLA framework. And that framework has specific aspects of culture that will reinforce this KMOL policy. Those include fostering a climate of openness, encouraging the use of relationships and networks to broaden situational awareness, and fostering continuous learning. 
Leaders who promote openness and transparency will contribute to a positive organizational culture where KMOL can flourish and contribute to better results. Our fourth leverage point is governance. So the policy aligns with several existing policy and guidance, guiding, guidance sources, including aspects of document management and uh, data warehousing, records management, the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act, the USAID Evaluation Policy, and the Evidence Act. But even with these many sources of policy and guidance, there's still a gap in KMOL policy and guidance, and the policy will establish a body to oversee and facilitate the implementation of this policy, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. The fifth leverage point focuses on resources. Robust and effective KMOL, as we've said, requires resources to advance agency goals. The policy will lead to guidance on how to do that, how to actually resource KMOL to strengthen these practices and systems. And the final leverage point is systems. So we already have a lot of IT systems linked with associated processes that are indispensable to the work the agency does. But the agency will fill in gaps, uh, work towards greater access and interoperability, and increase coherence between technology and business processes. Those business processes, these are the three that we want to affect change. And so business process one is, involves the design and implementation of programming. This is an essential function for the agency as demonstrated by the increasing uh, programming dollars that USAID has. Looking back in the early 2000s, it was around 10 billion annually. And in 2022, it was close to 25 billion. This work requires coordination and collaboration across the agency and with external actors. Business process two involves hiring, developing, retaining, and transitioning a global workforce. It's a struggle for staff to find the knowledge they need when they need it for their work. And a key element of the policy is to strengthen the agency as a learning organization. And this involves approaching workforce functions as critical opportunities to build, retain, and use knowledge. And the last business process involves bu budget formulation. So the agency programs congressionally appropriated resources to achieve its objectives and regularly report on results. We have increasingly sophisticated systems that have been employed to ensure transparency of funding and results, but opportunities exist for stakeholders to be able to further parse that information in ways that serve their different needs. So with the implementation of this policy, staff will be able to consistently find reliable data on funding levels or results. Several of these KMOL leverage points could dramatically improve the efficiency of these business processes by standardizing practices or making staff aware of already existing practices. By way of this policy, the agency is developing a deliberative and focused approach to strengthening the foundation for KMOL. The key to realizing that vision will be investing in the leadership and the resources and the time to allow for the policy's implementation to pay dividends in the form of more efficient systems, reduced frustration, and better development outcomes. At this point, I'll pass this off to my colleague, Adrian. Okay, let's see. Um, we're actually great on time because we banked on a 30 minute presentation and 15 minutes for questions. So, um, I don't know if people are feeling, I know we have a coffee break coming up, but I was gonna just stop since we have like three extra minutes and say, since we have a coffee break and I know we just had lunch and we might be sleepy, if those of you that are able to stand up and just do like a quick wiggle, right, stretch, please indulge me in that. If you're not able to stand, your neck, yeah, there we go. Just trying to wake us up and make sure we, because we're going to get into the really fun part now, <laughs> the requirements. Um, no, but really, uh, thanks, Melissa and Tom. Um, so with any policy, right, knowing kind of where we are historically, where we started in USAID, establishing a function, and then where the policy is and the type of vision the policy is putting forward, um, something that's 
crucial, right, and important is for us to address needs that USAID staff and also the implementing partners that we work with are addressed. And so we have two main requirements to, to realize this vision. And we left the requirements uh, nimble to an extent because we don't want to overburden staff with too many requirements. Um, and so the main one is number one, which is the development of KMOL plans or knowledge management and organizational learning plans. Um, and that is a requirement for USAID staff specifically. Um, institute, and the impacts, right, as detailed there, is with the goals of institutionalizing KMOL across USAID business processes, but also helping reduce burdens, create efficiencies, and protect knowledge investments. And the second requirement is a governance structure or the creation of a governance body at the agency wide that is composed by agency leadership. Um, and, and the goal there is to maintain high level commitment for USAID with KMOL and also um, have routes for deliberate planning to address resource and workforce considerations. So those are the two main things. Um, for the purpose of the pr this presentation, we're not going to get too much into requirement number two. So I'm going to go now into requirement number one um, and what the main components for the KML plans will be. Um, there's two required components. It's these two here. The first one being uh, knowledge retention and transfer. And to that end, we've developed a model um, that has been tested. And I'll, I'll speak about it in a sec a little bit more. And then the second required component is Google Workspace norms and best practices. Why Google Workspace? That's where we work. Um, almost everyone, right, or a lot of people use Microsoft, SharePoint, and whatnot. We're in the Google universe. Um, hence, probably some of the quirks that you saw that I didn't catch translating from a Google presentation to a PowerPoint um, for here. So, so those, these are the two main uh, required components for KML plans. Um, we are also providing staff with other suggestions that are not requirements, but recommendations that they could include as part of their knowledge management plans. So what is the KRT model or the knowledge retention and transfer model? And I will refer to it as KRT for now on. Um, basically provides tools, processes, and practices for individuals, so be it staff, um, uh, sorry, individuals, operating units. Operating units is the term that we use to identify either teams, offices, bureaus, missions, um, and, and we've left it um, loose there too when it comes to how these requirements should uh, happen for each operating unit and also for the agency. Um, and the goal is to improve knowledge handover um, and in turn, right, improve efficiency and programmatic and operational learning. And one of the main reasonings why we're focusing on KRT is because, as you saw from Melissa's slide at the very beginning, we're in 80 different countries, but we work in over 100 countries. And so we have a large portion of our staff are foreign service officers, which means depending on the post, they're rotating every year or every two years up to every four years. So we have a lot of staff turnover happening at all times. And so this is really a big pain point, right? As people go from one mission to the next, right? We're trying to avoid leaving vacuums of knowledge and making sure that the staff that stay behind and the staff that come in are able to to have the knowledge and information necessary to keep making decisions and moving uh, and maintaining that programmatic momentum that is happening in those operating units. Um, the KRT model includes a toolkit, so there's a collection of tools, um, about nine or 10 there, an implementation checklist, and a maturity matrix, specifically on KRT, not knowledge management. Um, and these are the three main phases as to how we divided the, the model itself. Um, the two transfer phases with the external arrows, offboarding and onboarding, and then the, the blue circle in the middle, um, the ongoing phase, which is we've labeled the knowledge retention phase, right? Everything else that happens outside of people coming in and out of a specific um, post. And all of these resources are actually available to the public, and we'll share 
um, the site at the end of the presentation as well. Um, Google Workspace, the second required component, uh, we've established uh, an SOP, a standard operating procedure in our bureau that includes standard naming conventions, requirements and best practices, and tasks for onboarding and offboarding. Um, and this is, you know, as, as anywhere where you work, and I'm sure maybe with some colleagues you face this, right, there's different levels of understanding and of knowing how to use different systems and different parts of, of, of the Google Workspace universe. And so trying to get to a consensus in terms of um, making this really effective, right? Making sure that we know where we're organizing our information, our knowledge, our documents, and people are able to access it. And we try and avoid as much as possible the need to have to go to that one colleague that knows where everything is, right? Um, because we all know how we're organizing this universe of uh, work documents that we use on a day-to-day. -day. So that is the main goal um, of this part, of the, or, or of this component. Okay, enough with that. How are we gonna support implementation? This is the fun part, also the hardest part, and the trickiest part, and I see a lot of head nodding, yes. Um, luckily for us, uh, the agency mandates with any policy that we write uh, 60 days after publication, an implementation plan. You know, how are we gonna oversee and make sure that this gets implemented across the agency? So we have that almost at the very end. Again, we're still going through clearance of the policy, so we need to wait a little bit to see what other changes might come. Um, but that's, that's the main, is having an implementation plan uh, for the agency, for the policy. The second one is, is the governance body, which is tied to that second requirement. It is important that we have leadership buy-in, right? That agency leadership are invested and also um, they create the incentives so that um, all the staff, right, feel the need and feel excited to do KMOL. Um, so that's uh, the second one. And then an ADS chapter. ADS chapters are USAID's operational policies. So once we publish this uh, current policy, which is a development policy, um, which lays out the vision and, and the what, um, we are gonna put out an operational chapter. This will also be public, and that will contain the nuts and bolts, right? How are staff going to do this? So as part of the operational uh, policy, we're going to include a template for the KML plans, different tools related to knowledge retention and transfer, and many, many more uh, tools that are not necessarily requirements, but that we know will be important to enable the changes that we wanna see and help staff be able to carry out KMOL in their context. Um, the fourth bullet point is a KMOL action group. So this is internal, that's what we've called it. Um, it's a part of a larger community of practice but it is growing and basically we just have a collection and trying to group in um, knowledge management experts, enthusiasts, champions across the agency. Um, we actually meet once a month and discuss different topics related to KMOL and it's very much membership driven. So based on what staff, the questions they have, the interests that they have. And as of this moment, we have four different working groups within uh, this community, this action group. And I can talk about that more if people have questions. And we also have uh, multiple internal websites where we include all of our resources that we've created, not just from the KML function itself, but also resources from across the agency that have been either shared with us via different communities of practice or the KML action group trying to co-locate them in a location where people across the agency can just find it in one place. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how we'll support um, implementation. And I'll take any other questions on that later. Um, and then how might the policy be implemented within our programs? So the goals are, oh, colors aren't great here. The goals, right, um, they're grouped into different colors. We wanna identify where good KM is happening across the agency, right? And what those pra practices are that are directly supporting the outcomes we want to see our programs achieve. And again, USAID 
is a donor, we have programs around very different areas, like Melissa mentioned, right? Um, anything from agriculture to conflict prevention to humanitarian assistance and more. Um, and we wanna make sure that those examples, we promulgate them across the agency, right? That they do not remain in silos, either be it in the countries or regions, but go beyond that. And that we have agency champions take those up and run with them. Um, and that's really where we're trying to serve this purpose of being the connectors across the agency, right? That connective tissue so that people can figure out what's going on everywhere um, and, and use those examples. And then we also want to learn from other organizations. A lot of the knowledge in international development comes from outside of USAID um, and other federal government agencies right, who are also incorporating knowledge management, who perhaps have been doing this for longer than we have, um, and learning, right? incorporate those learnings into our programmings, awards, and grants. Um, and last but not least, our implementing partners, be it the contractors, the awardees, and others, right, that are improving upon their skills and practices, and that also are doing knowledge management in different settings while working with us at USAID. So I'll leave it at that. And look, 29 minutes, 41 seconds. <laughs> if you wanna learn more about USAID, please feel free to go here for any questions. We have this email, kmol at usa.gov. Um, the page that I alluded to and the presentation should be available for folks at the conference. So you'll also be able to download it and click on these. Um, is USA Learning Lab. You will find the knowledge retention and transfer model and other resources around local knowledge and other work that we have done that is available to the public. And so we'll move to the Q&A, and I'll pass it back to Melissa for a moderation of that, if there's, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thanks. Questions, anybody? So what are some of the actual um, development outcomes that you achieved, and with which piece of the KM policy is that? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that, see if any of my panelists want to have a go also. So some, like we have a ton of different development outcomes, right, in all of our sectors. And so like early childhood reading and achievements and maternal child health, right, reduction in maternal child mortality, different um, productivity in agricultural commodities and, and different value chains. So we have a lot of different um, kinds of outcomes that are of interest to all of our operating units. In terms of how KM nests within those and supports those, some of our sectors actually have that embedded into how they do their work. They see that through working with, say, their health workers and by ha them having improved knowledge management practices, they are actually more effective at what they do and they're seeing better outcomes in the areas that they're working in. So those are really interesting examples that we found in our evidence review of how some of our implementing partners have embedded KM into their theories of change in their programs and how that actually leads to, for us that's called, that's business value. Those development outcomes, that's business value. So that's one example. In terms of how, and I'm not sure if that really gets at your question, because I see a skeptical look on your face. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a really deep question. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, but we that's actually documented. There's a there's a publication on that. I think on our on our deck, I could we could follow up later and share that study with you. I can. Oh, Adrian, you want to I can tackle also? Maybe share an example too. Um, so Stacy and I were fortunate to do a TDY together earlier this summer. TDY, travel, we went to one of our missions. Um, and something that came up from our conversations was we, this mission is a particularly well-resourced mission, so they have a big number of staff. 
And something we realized is they had two different offices. One was the education office, and then I think it was the water office, because there's a big projects around water, that were working with the same ministry for building with this country. And none of the offices knew who each other's point of contact in that ministry was and what they were doing and who they're reaching out to. So for all they know, they may be reaching out to the same person, to very different people. Um, and that's always a struggle, right? Because we're also partnering and collaborating with host governments. Um, and so part of what we want to be able to facilitate with KM is making sure that even those silos within the same country mission aren't happening, right? That KM is that facilitator and say, okay, if we have different people working with the same infrastructure or building ministry, we need to get together because we're working on it on different sectors, right? Education's building schools, the water is doing sewage and systems, but we're working with the same people. What are the best practices? How do we make sure that, um, you know, we get quick responses. Are we getting the same responses? Are we burdening the same person in that ministry? And so, so that's more of an example of the things we want to avoid that we know happen very often. So that's where we want to get to and where we hope the policy is gonna help staff be able to, to make those connections. Thanks. Great example, I love that example. Love that. Um, there was one question up here, and then I, there's one in the middle and one in the back. We'll go in that order. Uh, and, and the two-part question, you should answer one or both. <laughs> um, the first is, how would you like to see implementing partners get involved? Like, is mm -hmm. there a way for us to be meeting, obviously, the outside of the KML action group that seems to be internal to DSA, but is there a role for uh, implementing partners to get to getting involved at this stage now that the policy is so close to being approved? And my second question is, The second one. You may have to add to the first, so, too, because um, I, 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 as an implementing partner, I can tell you a little bit about my experience, but not necessarily about the plans, because I'm not, um, it's, it's, it, the policy hasn't been cleared, so I don't know exactly what the plans are. But certainly, there are lots of um, examples where USA does this work already, right? So there are lots of um, bright spots around KM and knowledge management portals and CLA and the CLA case competition. Again, CLA is collaborating, learning, and adapting, which is a, another framework that we have. Um, so I think within any sort of implementation that's already existing, there are ways to go ahead and, and, and get involved. And one of the things Adrian mentioned, I think, sorry, he was, somebody mentioned it, was that we were going to, maybe it was humorous, but anyway, surface those, uh, those great examples. Um, CLA case competition is one example, but I think that there are plans to do more of that. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that and then answer the more difficult question. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't have more to add that I can think of um, to the first question of, yeah. Yeah, sorry. No. Um, the second one. So when it comes to our requirement, just to ground it here and then I'll go broader. Um, this, the requirements are only for USAID staff and you know we work in Google, so we're trying to help as much as possible staff get up to speed within the Google universe. That is a, your question gets at a perennial issue that, and, and something that's sometimes, uh, it's hard to overcome to an extent because we do work with, um, in this we see it much more in our missions as well than we even do in DC is we work in close collaboration with the Department of State and they fully operate in, within Office, Microsoft Office. And so a lot of the times there is, um, you know, trying to develop s processes or putting in place either SOPs or the best practices for how do we work with people outside of the agency. And a lot of the times it means um, we're gonna work in Microsoft Office, right? And whenever we get to the final document, that's what we then take and put in Google. Um, other times, it means that we work in Google. Some federal government agencies, right, when we're working with them, do not, are not able to open Google Docs. And so, so it, is, it is an issue. And so part of what we're trying to help staff get at is 
kind of figure out what are those best practices that some, or many, I should say, from, uh, from our whole agency have figured out here and there so that we can make sure that people are replicating those good practices. Because it is, it is an issue and it'll keep coming up as long as we're in Google and everyone else is in Microsoft. Yeah. We have five minutes, so hopefully there's time for those two questions that I saw if they're not two parters in the middle. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, that's, okay, so that's part of why accessibility is a principle that we featured. That is a huge issue um, in our organization. Um, translation is, remember earlier how I said we operate sometimes like a federation? That's one of those examples where we operate like a federation. Um, we don't corporately do translation for every uh, document or big publication that's produced. Many of our operating units take that on. Many operating units are innovating in that space. I think AI is going to provide a lot of opportunities for us in that space. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how we get better at doing that. Um, but we are definitely going to need to leverage something that's low cost and high efficiency to be able to do it because we have so many languages, right, that uh, are uh, relevant. So question in the back. Yeah, it's definitely going to be federated. I'm going to ask Adrian to take to take that one, but um, we aren't asking anybody to get up to speed with knowledge transfer like overnight, right? We <laughs> want people to understand that to to invest that time and that energy in that deep, rich contextual understanding of where they're working um, in order to be effective. So, Adrian. Yes. So with uh, that's one of the biggest things we want to approach with as part of the knowledge retention and transfer model. Um, and I would say that the main tool there is uh, the handover memo, which I know it's written, right? So it's hard to capture different types of knowledge just in a written document. But the goal there is when we're looking at programmatic momentum, right? And looking at the different programs. So say I am leaving and I am the program office director. Um, and I know different types of decisions that I need to make that for, because they will fall outside of when I'm in this mission, the next person needs to make, right? So it's more about curating, it's like, here is where you find the important knowledge and information that's gonna give you the context on all of these programs that we have, and here's the key decisions that you will have to make. Um, so there's curation in that way as part of the, the, the KRT model. There's also the biggest resource and sometimes one of the least used is our foreign service nationals. So in every mission that we work, we have staff that are local to the country and they um, carry the institutional memory. Um, a lot of foreign service nationals have been in their missions for 10, 20, 30 years, right? And so they have deep contextual, not only from being locals to the country or from being, right, from, from the culture and, and, and that, that we're working, but also because of their years of work with USAID. So leveraging them and their expertise um, to fill in, right, where, where people might have gaps when it comes to the work that USAID is doing within country as well. We have if 30 seconds if there's any last quick question. Okay, in the back. <clears throat> oh my. Yeah, there's, we've got a lot of AI conversations going on. Um, that is currently led by our CIO shop and we are pushing, pushing, pushing and advocating and pulling together 
relevant stakeholders. Um, but with the executive order that the White House released on artificial intelligence, every federal agency is going to have to um, produce something and tee up sort of how they're going to implement that executive order. So that space is moving hourly. <laughs> I feel it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.